in um, Guyana and and also those that you, that were affected that you, that you had actually observed as um, being um, in bad condition uh, were they recent arrivals or were they people who had already been there? Let me, let me try and answer the, the first part and then we'll see if we can maybe get Philippa back to give you a bit more detail uh, from the ground. Um, I don't have an overall figure uh, for the region of the Warao population who have left Venezuela. Um, the estimate inside Venezuela is between 40 and 50,000. Uh, and then in Guyana, um, uh, the estimate is two and a half thousand, as was mentioned. I don't have a figure for the entire region, but I'll find that and, and get back to you on that. In terms of more details on the medical state, I would have to defer to Philippa, who's on the ground there, and I, I don't think she's able to come back. So, so let me get, get that back to you as well after this. Antonio. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, I just want to, to ask Philippa to send us uh, the notes that she read because we couldn't understand a lot. Thank you. Absolutely, that's understood, and they're published now or very soon, and we'll get them to you. Thanks. John, can you ask your question about uh, other refugees? Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, Matthew. I was wondering if you could bring us up to speed on what UNHCR is doing with the situation of asylum seekers and refugees trying to find their way to the United Kingdom from the French coast. If you have the numbers, how many do you think are uh, being processed in France? How many are being processed in the UK that have successfully made it over the channel? And uh, what is the UNHCR office in London and in Paris doing? Uh, and if you can give us the numbers, uh, because I think there's confusion. So some people think they're all migrants, but I understand quite a few are asylum seekers and refugees as well. Can you clear the air there? Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that the events that we saw the other day are, tr are truly tragic. And of course, our hearts go out to the loved ones of all those who have lost their lives. Uh, and it was an unprecedented event in the channel. And of course, we hope it drives concerted action. But sadly, it's all too common in other parts of the world, especially in the Mediterranean. Um, in terms of the numbers, we at UNHCR don't actually have those numbers in the UK. Um, we've seen reports uh, that are suggesting that 25, 24, 25,000 have crossed in small boats to the UK this year. Um, but those are home office numbers and they're UK numbers. And likewise, we don't have a precise estimate of the numbers who are um, over in Calais in that region at the moment. As you know, there have been various operations to try and move asylum seekers and migrants on. Um, and we haven't actually had a, a direct mission there in the last days. Um, I might just add, though, John, in terms of solutions, um, obviously, we think it's important that there is a concerted effort to try to crush the smugglers' rings. The smugglers have been very adaptive uh, in the recent months. It's very important also that information is provided to those who are on, on the coast in northern France about the risks, the really real dangers that, that, that they um, will, will have if they cross the channel. And of course, we say that it's very important, uh, specifically in the UK um, context, that there are fast and fair asylum procedures. Um, the system has become a little bit silted up in recent years and months, and that hampers solutions. The other thing that we would add is cooperation between the two countries, but also between the UK uh, and Europe is extremely important. And then, of course, safe and legal routes. Safe and legal routes are, are essential and, and they can be an important means of people avoiding having to take these precarious journeys. Um, and we know that particularly in the case of the UK, the numbers who have been able to benefit from programs like resettlement and family reunion uh, have declined recently, uh, partly as a result of COVID. A follow up, John? Yes, Matthew. Um, if I could come back on, on the data, what's the reason both France and the UK are signatories to the 51 Convention? Are you asking for the detailed information and the uh, member states are not providing it? Or, or what, what seems to be the problem? It's highly unusual for UNHCR that's got 
precision down to the last human being on the ground, not having the data in these two cases. Uh, thanks, John. We know the numbers of asylum seekers in the UK. We know the numbers of asylum seekers in France. But because this situation is fluid, is changing day by day, some days uh, there are hundreds crossing. There were reports that one day there were, was over a thousand crossing. We're not actually monitoring day by day those numbers. So those questions would have to be referred to uh, the Home Office in the UK and the Interior Ministry in France. But we do have the annual figures, of course. Thank you very much, Matt. And I don't see any other question. And yes, if you could send the notes, uh, Philippa notes, that would be very, very useful. Thank you very much. Just a little bit of housekeeping. I know you were waiting for Christian. He's just arrived. But we have a last announcement from Sarah, uh, a short announcement, and then we will go to WHO. So, and, and, and that will be our last speaker. So, Sarah, you, you want to briefly announce something about the building bridges this week? Yeah, exactly. So in the, in the context of the Building Bridge Week, we have our UNDP Geneva flagship event that is focusing on SDG finance. Just to remind you that the financial needs to achieve the SDG in developing country have skyrocketed. Uh, with COVID, I think the OECD estimates that the needs are up to 4.5 trillion a year. And one way to redirect mainstream capital flows is to identify a pipeline of bankable companies working on product and services that focus on impact and the bottom of a pyramid. And it's exactly what we're doing. Um, so to serve as purpose, 15 entrepreneurs from 10 developing countries um, identify through a UNDP program, which is called the Growth Stage Impact Venture, and working on access to quality health, clean energy, and waste management um, will come to Geneva next Thursday and they will pitch in front of investors, last corporate development organization. And they're obviously looking for partners to scale up their, their product and serve more beneficiaries. So the 15 enterprise are all mid-sized with an average of up to 100 employees. They have an annual revenue between half a million and over $5 million. And all together, they represent um, an investment opportunities of about $48 million. And they also impact the lives of um, about 1.2 million people in developing countries. Just to give you an example, because there are some really good stories there, like we've got, for instance, Benpu Health uh, in India, and the company delivers life-saving technology intervention such as a neonatal bra bracelet that monitors newborn temperature. And you need to know that like one of the big cause of um, infant mortality in India is hypothermia. So that's like a, a direct solution. And this is a, like a very financially, very uh, successful companies. So we've got 15 example um, of a type coming to Geneva. What is really interesting is that these entrepreneurs demonstrate that there's a business case for the SDG in developing countries. So we're not talking about philanthropy. We're really um, looking at entrepreneurs who are changing the landscape of access to healthcare, clean energy, and waste management in um, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But also they are really interesting investment opportunities and they can really support that redirection of mainstream capital flows towards sustainable finance. So just let me know if you have an interest to meet with some of them. And I've had it, the profile of those entrepreneurs in the, in the notes that you're going to receive over Alejandro and Sandra. Thank you very much. I see John has raised, oh no, sorry, John has put it down. Paula. Yeah, hi again. Um, so I just wanted to know that this Building Bridges um, conference is largely sponsored by Swiss banks. And, you know, given the fact that you're going to be, you know, that the idea is to, to listen to them, to get their, you know, get them to finance a lot of these programs, sustainable programs. Um, I just wanted to know whether uh, UNDP finds that uh, the Swiss banking sector is doing enough to promote diversity within its ranks. That's of course going to be reflecting in the sort of 
uh, investment decisions that are going to be made uh, in this in this area. Sarah? So, yeah, Paula, my, my first comment is that I'm not a spokesperson for the for the Building Bridge Week. I know that you're attending and um, there will be some press conference every morning. I guess the Monday morning would be the right moment where you can ask that question um, regarding UNDP. So we have different ways of working with the finance sector, including the Swiss finance sector and at different levels because if you want to unlock mainstream capital flows, you need to work on the pipeline, basically on the supply and demand, but also on the, the standard and the transparency issue, which is, I think, at the core of your question. One of the way we work on that is to work with many different organizations on standards so that institution, like the Swiss financial institution, can really track and then um, also um, you know, disclose how they how they invest and i think this is also the role of civil society to request for more disclosure and that's one of the key topic of uh, the building bridge week but once again i would encourage you to ask that question directly also to the organizer of the building bridge week. thank you very much sarah and indeed uh, we have uh, we have distributed already uh, quite a few information on the uh, building bridges week which is co-organized by the Sustainable Development uh, Goals Laboratory, uh, SDG Lab, of the Office of the uh, UNOG uh, uh, Director General. And as we have also announced, the Deputy Secretary General will participate in some of the events at the beginning of this uh, important uh, uh, initiative, uh, the, the, in particular, the summit uh, of 2021 here in Geneva. Um, uh, and if you haven't received, of course, uh, all the information is available and there is also a, a website which is called buildingbridges.org with all the program and the uh, information on how to register. Um, John, is that for Sarah? Otherwise, I yes, really want to Yes, that is for go Sarah. To... It's for so... Sarah. It's for Sarah. Okay, go ahead. It's your day. Yeah. Yes. Sarah, uh, is, has there been a response from the office of the executive director to the press release by a group of eminent human rights NGOs, including Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, that your report on Egypt was flawed. Sarah? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna take that as a, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with you and I'm gonna connect you to Dylan, who will provide the statement on on that issue, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. And so now is uh, definitely, last but not least, Christian, who has just joined us in person, which I'm very happy to to see that we have a WHO person in Shehai us at the briefing. And you have an important uh, uh, update on the this new variant B11. Five two nine. Exactly, but uh, and then that if that doesn't merit being here in person, I don't know. But let me first remind everybody that Monday morning starts the uh, WHO uh, special session of the World Health Assembly. Um, it lasts three days from 29 November until 1 December, um, and with only one agenda item, as you know, considering uh, anything what is labeled so far as uh, possible development of a pandemic treaty. Um, in parenthesis. The meeting starts at 10 o'clock on Monday morning with the opening session, uh, welcoming speeches and other high-level speeches. The detailed um, uh, agenda is not yet finalized, but everything you can find on the web, the links have been sent around, and all three days of sessions will be webcast. So that's that, and as you may imagine, it's a very, it seems like a very timely um, event to come now on to what's um, making the news right now. WHO is closely monitoring the recently reported variant B112529. I report. WHO is closely monitoring the recently reported variant B11529. WHO is convening a meeting of the Technical Advisory Group on Virus Evolution, so-called TAG VE, today actually starting noon Geneva time, which is in a short moment. 
to better understand the timeline for studies that are underway and to determine if this variant should be designated as a variant of interest or a variant of concern. The terms of reference of the tag uh, we can be found on our website. Early analysis show that this variant has a large number of mutations that require and will undergo further study. It will take a few weeks for us to understand what impact this variant has. Researchers are working to understand more about the mutations and what they potentially mean for how transmissible or virulent this variant is and how they may impact our diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. This variant, the B11529, was reported at a remarkable speed. The first sequence was reported on 11 November. We are grateful for the researchers in South Africa and the experts on WHO's TAG um, group on virus evolution who are working on this. The detection of the Zerion means that the surveillance system is in place and is working. It is again really outstanding uh, how open and transparent this was and these findings are really important. After the uh, meeting of the Technical Advisory Group on Virus Evolution today, the, we will inform you whether the variant is going to be classified as a variant of interest or concern. And we will share any re relevant information soon as after. We will also share further guidance for governments on actions they can take. Um, while this is ongoing, it's important to remind ourselves that there's a lot we can do at this right moment before we even know much about the virus or about this variant to protect ourselves. First, the more COVID-19 circulates, the more opportunities this virus has to change, to mutate and develop different uh, forms. It is essential that we all continue to work to reduce the circulation of COVID-19. We need more people to be vaccinated everywhere and we need each need to take all the other measures that are out there to protect ourselves that starts with the masks uh, avoiding larger gatherings um, hand hygiene uh, ventilating rooms and meeting rooms whenever possible and so on and so forth so these are the measures that we know work and these are the measures that we know will continue work um, even if we don't know yet exactly the, the details of this variant. We need to further reduce our risk of exposure and prevent ourselves from, from passing the virus, the COVID-19 virus, from one to another. I'll leave it at that for now. And you won't because there is a serious question long like this. So we start with Gunilla. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. But as you know, there are very strong reactions uh, surrounding this new variant. Would you be able to say in any way how how worried people should be? And when do you expect to have a decision if this is a variant of concern or interest uh, today or in a couple of weeks? And perhaps also, could you say something about um, the several countries imposing now travel restrictions before we know if it even is? how dangerous the virus is. Thanks. Many questions in one, Christian. I thank you very much, Gunilla. I guess that sums up most of the questions anyway. Um, well, let me start with the, with the meeting as such. The meeting, um, I don't know how long it will take today, but uh, the decisions on that part, I'm pretty sure will come out today um, and we will communicate right afterwards. I cannot give you a timeline, but the meeting is starting soon and in a couple of hours we will be ready to communicate the outcomes or we'll do it as soon as possible afterwards, of course. Now, to your question whether people should be worried. Again, um, while a variant develops when it can, there are a lot of things we can do to protect ourselves at this very moment. I, mean, I will repeat, wear the mask whenever possible. Even if you look around the room here, everybody in this room where we're sitting right now who's not act actively on the podium is, is wearing a mask. When you meet people in the hallways, they're meeting a mask. So keep wearing your mask whenever possible and appropriate. Um, avoid larger gatherings when possible. 
um, ventilate rooms to make it harder for the virus to settle and to, uh, to transmit, um, and keep a, an, an overall hygiene, hand washing, and all the measures that we know. We know they work, we know they reduce transmission. That is important, and this is what we can do today. Um, let the experts have a work on this, and this will take a few weeks to determine exactly um, the details about this variant, the transmissibility, uh, whether it's con how, how contagious it is, and so on and so forth. So this will take a few weeks. Again, let's not forget, only two weeks ago, on 11 November, was this first isolated, and it's really remarkable that we are at this stage already today to talk in details about it, but conclusions will not be uh, over today, not be finalized today. On travel restrictions, yeah, I think that's uh, that's another part here. Um, also here, um, countries can do a lot to to work on surveillance, on sequencing, and collaborate with uh, the affected countries or with other countries uh, to work scientifically globally on fighting this virus and this variant. But WHO recommends that countries continue to apply a risk-based and scientific approach when implementing travel measures in accordance with the temporary recommendations of the Ninth Emergency Committee.